Hello and welcome to CDA Oasis. I am Shiraz Gesayer and I welcome once again Dr. Paul Betziki, General Dentist from Toronto. He is here to share another uh, clinical case with us. So Dr. Belziki, welcome to CDA Oasis. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Good to be here. So what is the case about? I always ask you this question at, at the beginning. What is the case about and what are the main takeaways? Okay, um, as I've said in the past, <clears throat> Every case has a weak link where there's some, some important aspect of it that is critical to note or that drives the case. And this is such, such a case. And sometimes the weak link isn't a technical problem, although this case is filled with technical problems. Sometimes it's patient, it's the patient management. And this is such a case where the patient's resistance to taking advice in a timely fashion caused a lot of unnecessary tooth destruction that just added complications to the case as it went on. And although this gentleman is, he's been with me since uh, 2020, since uh, 2000, near 20 years, wonderful gentleman, very sweet, very friendly, very, uh, just just wonderful but is resistant to dental to to dental care or accepting what would be in his best interest and this is such a case so for those of you new to the series i'm a general practitioner i provide periodontics endodontics and restorative dentistry and my philosophy of treatment is to endeavor to integrate all of these protocols to deliver long-lasting restorations that will hopefully last a patient's lifetime. That's the intent. And that's my definition of success. The longer I can make it last, the more successful I am. And success is a planned event. You just don't bump into it at the end of an appointment when you find the cement in the case. There's usually multiple factors and procedures have to be linked together in a strong chain of events. And that chain, that chain of success is only as strong as the weakest link. And it's important to identify that link. And sometimes it's the pay, it's the dentist contribution, it's our knowledge, our skill level, and hopefully that increases with time and experience. Guiding the laboratory phase is important. That has to be within our realm of influence as well. And it's our professional ethics. Like, are we striving to do the best we can for a patient? our honesty and integrity. <clears throat> and then there's the patient's contribution. What are they like? What's their physiology? Are they, are they weak, aged, polypharmacology? Sometimes that is an important thing to understand. It's, and their psychology, what do they expect from us? Are they, are they friendly? Are they easy to work on? Are they belligerent? And I've, I've had those types of patients and it makes even for cases where the technical aspect is easy, the, there can be difficulties overcoming that. So their demands and their expectations and their, and their personal ethics. Like, are they honest and, and engaging? And I must say, before I go any further, this patient, this case, this gentleman is just a wonderful gentleman in terms of honesty, personality, and, and integrity. But he was, his, that component was a weak link that drove difficulties in this case. So as the title says, sometimes the patient's psychology and physiology can be something that drives a case. And in this case, it just was his reluctance to accept treatment plans in a timely fashion. So you can see he's in his 50s, very big, robust gentleman, huge mass of the muscles, and he's tearing up his occlusion. And you can see this is in 2008. You can see what he's done thus far. And I said, look, we, we, we should get to this at some point. We should start restoring these teeth because now it's easy or easier to work on individual teeth, put crowns on teeth and, and just build this case up. And it may involve working on multiple teeth at a time, but 
for whatever reasons, he said, Doc, nothing's bothering me. And so I'm fine. I don't, I don't want to do anything. Okay. Just a general overview. This is the fourth quadrant. I had put this gold crown here in 2005. And this is the left side, the upper arch. There were periodontal concerns regarding that too. He had lost the molar here. And this lateral, this lateral was starting to pose a problem. So there it is in 2008. And we had to do endo for that too because it just got sore. So endodontics was done. I wanted to restore this tooth. And as you can see, there is a bit of a bony defect there. So as I said earlier, I tried to integrate endoperio and restorative dentistry. This is such a case. I could tell that the tissue wasn't as healthy as I would have liked, raised a flap. And sometimes you get these nodules, you get these deposits of calculus, which you don't see, you can't feel, it's been burnished. But upon reflection of a flap, you can pick these things up. The area was, was cleaned up. A provisional was placed that healed, went on to restore this tooth with a cast post core and ultimately a crown. And I've gone over this in other presentations, how to, how to provide cast post cores. So I was done in 2008 and some four years later, I started to notice he's really starting to thin up and tear up the tooth structure. And here you can see it occlusally in this area. He's starting to get past the enamel, deep into the dentin, and that may even be very close to the pulp chambers where we may have some sort of reparative dentin that's being laid down. Here's a comparison from 2008 to 2012. And this is, this is a lot of wear and tear. I brought this to his uh, attention. I said, we should work on this before the teeth become symptomatic. Maybe we can get crowns on these teeth. Because my fear is with time, it'll just get into the canals. You can see the areas there. Uh, and there will be the need to do endo compromising and weakening these teeth already on an individual that has shown to have a very hard aggressive bite. 2008 to 2012, these wear facets have continued to strip down and just is ongoing. I take a lot of these photographs I embed it in, in a document, I label, number all of the teeth, and then I, I write out a treatment plan. So he can go back and forth and I tell him tooth, the particular tooth number. So I did provide him a letter saying, we really should get to, to your teeth and this is why. So I'm doing my due diligence to try to educate the patient and tell him, let's work on this. Doc, Thank you very much. It's not bothering me. Okay, I'll wait. Sometimes you need symptoms to, to push treatment. 2016, and he came in once or twice a year for cleanings. We noted this and I would take these photographs and say, look, this is what that initial lateral looked like. And because it's out of, made out of porcelain, it's holding up quite nicely. We really should get to these teeth. And so it's not for lack of trying. So again, I know in my mind, this is just adding difficulties to any finer, final restorative endeavor. And then you can see what we're up against. For those, and I don't know how people can maintain, I have a metal-free dental practice. Gold, I love gold. Uh, that's been in since 2005. That's been giving 11 years of service. If this was any other material, it would have been long gone and broken. Thankfully, gold gives up of itself. There is a wear facet, but it has secured that too for a decade. And there you have it. 2016, getting closer and closer, you can start to make out the redness just underneath the dentin. And indeed he came in 
in 2016. There you can see uh, some years earlier, 2012. And in July, I had to do endo for the cusp. Came in, it was sore, it hurt, sensitive. So I did the endo for the cuspid. I said, come back, we'll address this. And it wasn't, I didn't have to drill dentin. I just had to put the probe over top and I could pop through into the canal. So that was done here as well. So endodontics were done for these teeth. I got some canal spaces ready so I could restore these teeth with cast post cores and ultimately crowns. And uh, wrote him a letter. This is, you can't see, but it's dated 2016. And the letter got longer because the scope of treatment was getting more involved. So I did my part. And I, I, I believe it's almost the baseball rule. Three strikes and you're right. I tried telling him once. I tried telling the patient twice. And by the third time, I haven't convinced them. And I do my darndest. Well, when you're ready, I'll be ready. And that happened early in February of 2020, last year, just before COVID hit. He came in for a cleaning. I took a look at this and I said, oh my God, what happened? And in all likelihood, he had worn through the temporary little plugs that were there and just decayed, had taken the tooth apart. No symptoms. He has a very, very low lip line. So I didn't know if he was aware of it or family members weren't aware of it, but doc, I got problems. So I said, okay, we have, if you're ready. And one of the treatment options was if you have low priority on your dentition, let's just not get into anything fancy or extensive or expensive. Let's just start taking out teeth We'll try to keep some teeth, maybe a partial, even though trying to put a partial in this area with, the, with this bite would be difficult. I said, we can keep it simple, go with removable, take out teeth that, uh, that need to be taken out. And he said, after lengthy discussions, I'm too young to have a removable. Let's fix up my teeth and let's try to avoid implants. Okay, let's give it a go. So now I'm into redesigning and reconstructing the anterior segment of the upper arch. This is 2008, and now we're dealing with uh, 2020. Sorry for the difference in color temperature of the photographs of just different cameras. So in doing this, I usually take a study model and start adding with blue blockout material. What has it torn up? What's missing? What do I think a teeth with that width, what length should I have? And very quickly adding some light cured blockout material came up with that. Take a sheet of acetate, which will not bind to methyl methacrylate powder liquid or acrylic because that's what I will be using to make the provisionals. Then remove the excess and I'm left with this little stent which will serve to make the provisionals. In the appointment, I prepared central, lateral. I knew this would be a long appointment just to make the provisionals. I didn't know if I would keep one or both of those roots or remove them, but I knew it would be a struggle just to have him walk out with a provisional bridge. And basically what I've done here is just remove from the facial and the proximal. I did not remove anything from the lingual surface or the occlusal surface, recognizing that I would open up the bite because the teeth were so short. If I start repairing on the lingual, I'll have nothing left. So just flood that with some resin material, remove the excess, and spend a fair amount of time refining and making, here I'm just relining a provisional, just relining it to get good adaptation, and inserted this in his mouth, step back and say, what do you think? This is what I see. 
given your facial structure and what I think you've lost, this is what I think should be put back. And I give them a mirror, I have them look at it to capture it so they don't say, I made you look like Bucky Beaver for, for some unknown reason. And typically a patient will look at this and say, look, I really am not sure, but doc, I trust you, go for it. But I just, I just need all this documentation. Take an impression and then showing that I've tried to replicate what I had envisioned in my mind. And then do the same thing on this side. This is all done at one appointment. Make another stent prepare these teeth, which is what I've done. And then I want to extend the provisional over to the other bicuspid. And there's the guide and the surgical, not the surgical, but the, the provisional stent, making the provisional. So using powder liquid, methyl methacrylate, I know that this unset will adhere and bind very nicely to the set portion. So working on that, and this took some, oh, some four or five hours the time, by the time I prepared the teeth and all, et cetera. And I, I walked out with a nice smile. I did not have time to address the roots in this area. So he walked in like this, walked out like that, and everybody was quite pleased. He thought it was a little bit too light. I said, don't worry couple of couple of cups of coffee and it'll tone down. He came back uh, a, a week or so later to assess these questionable teeth, which are here and here. And I wasn't sure of the lateral, that area that I did surgery back in 2008, the tissue did not look great once again. So remove the provisionals, and there you can see this cast post and core has held up quite nicely. If there was any other material, it wouldn't. Raise the flap. I stared at this for a bit wondering, should I just take out this tooth? Um, how's this going to heal? He had two deposits of calculus there. I didn't make a definitive decision. I cleaned the area up, extracted these two roots. Now being methyl methacrylate, powder liquid, which is a material that adds to itself an innumerable amount of times. So I have to make alterations to the provisionals. I don't need to remake the provisionals from scratch. I can just add to the material using some foil here and close up these margins. And that, that was done and then COVID hit. And I didn't see him till August of 2020. He came in. Thankfully, this is acrylic, which I know is durable and robust, and it did end up getting a little bit stained, but it held up quite nicely over the months that we just weren't seeing anybody. We were in lockdown. So he's been comfortable with this arrangement. I've opened up the bite, but he's comfortable with it. No clicking, no popping, no TNJ symptoms whatsoever. So I want to maintain this vertical this vertical position as closely as possible. So being uh, acrylic, I can just section that crown from this provisional, put it on the tooth and then have them bite down in some warm wax. I like warm wax because it gives me time to manipulate the jaw, manage the jaw, get them into some sort of centric relation and have them close rather than trying to use some of the silicone impression materials, which just set so bloody fast, I really don't have time to do that. So I still use warm wax in some of these large cases. And that crown forms the occlusal stop where the vertical is at in the provisional phase. And you can see from the opposing arch, that's the little indentation. Just remove the provisional, pop in some Zoe, and just have them bite down again. And I've generated a nice accurate bite in wax. I did go on to extract the tooth at that appointment. And this is a few months later after healing's taking place. So now we're ready to do uh, impression taking. The tissue is pink, healthy, doesn't bleed. 
there's the provisionals. The teeth are reprepared, an impression is taken, and then the bridge is readapted, and that lateral is gone. Getting a bite because, and this gentleman is very difficult because it's almost as if the upper teeth almost encompass the lower teeth, very deep bite. And it was just hard for me to, to get a bite registration using wax or using DPS and pressure material for bite registration. So what I did is I had the lab make a little transfer coping out of acrylic on each tooth. And they made some occlusal stops, which were too thick. There's the prepared tooth. So I just trimmed that down. I measured the thickness on the lingual surface, which is about a millimeter. He had worn some away in the five to six months during lockdown that we didn't see him. So I was going to go for two millimeters. So I carved that down to about to, to less than that. I sectioned the bridge once again. And you can see when I did the first bite registration where I cut off that crown, I did reattach it. it takes five, 10 minutes. You just loot it together with, with the same resin material. So I sectioned down the middle, put half in, put that on the lateral, had him bite down here. I added some acrylic onto the back. So now when he bites down, it's coextensive. When he bites on the provisional, he bites on the little transfer coping. Then just switched it around and did, this, did the same thing for the other central. And while I was here, I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat if I just built this up to where the incisal edges on the provisionals, it would give the lab just more guidance of where I want my incisal edges. So just fiddling with a little uh, acrylic or composite resin that's like your the blue block out material. Join these two. And now I've got good occlusal stops on the two centrals. I can go ahead and then place some acrylic here, put the transfer copings in, have them bite down bilaterally. And now I've got a solid bite that I can visualize, that I can see that he's hitting everywhere where I think he's, he's hitting. Because if you have wax here or any other material, just don't know where, where it's at. Go back to the master model, park the transfer copings in place and I mounted the case. So this is just a very neat way of making sure that the bite that you've given the lab is accurate. Then the lab can go ahead, do their wax up. They put this little thimble in place. They see where the incisal edges should be and they can do their sufficient cut back and wax to allow for porcelain that will be well supported. That's just not all porcelain because these are short preps. And you don't wanna have porcelain too thick because in an aggressive bite like this, we'll just end up tearing up porcelain. The wax up and then the cases returned back to me for metal try-in. And I like to have these try-in in sections to make sure that everything fits. So this case is in three segments. And there are two areas for solder indexing. The solder joint will be through the pontic because that gives us the most surface area possible to get a good solder joint. When it's in the metal phase, I can try this in and typically they, uh, these come back a little bit too closed up. I like wide open embrasure spaces for cleansability. I, I don't, uh, I have to go for function and I have to go for durability. I wanna be able to get instruments in the final case so that the patient can clean it and I can clean it. So all those are addressed at the stage. They're secured onto the prepared teeth with some light body uh, impression material, some resin is flowed in the solder joint that's retrieved off the teeth and then a second set of pin dies is inserted in each respective retainer and the solder index is made. This I do in the office. So I know once I've made this 
whatever the lab does, it has to fit the solder index. If it fits the solder index, it'll fit the teeth. And these are just uh, a neat way of transferring information to the lab, a lot of photographs with notes, please mimic the occlusal design. I want to leave room to make the lower anteriors longer at some point. So I've trimmed back the metal, but I've left plenty of metal for support. So I've got a good rigid bridge. So this now, this case has now come back. It's been soldered. On a big case like this, I want to try in the metal framework without porcelain to make sure it goes in to place without any rock. I don't want to have, I don't want to find that out when I've got porcelain in place. So it did slide passively to place, bang on. Now I can take an over impression, a pickup impression, if you will, to generate a soft tissue model. Processing the porcelain before glazing, I had the patient come back, measured what was the length, the thickness over certain areas of the retainers. And this is the right central, it was four millimeters, and they got it banged on at four millimeters in the porcelain and metal face. So doing this assessment beforehand, and then the case goes back, just glaze it, it's perfect. And the case now comes back with no surprises. I know before I open up the box, this is going to fit quite nicely. On the day of insertion, tissue is perfect. I'm not chasing fluids, I'm not chasing blood. So it makes insertion a piece of cake. It's the easiest part now. And the case is completed and inserted with no surprises. And there you have it. Now I cemented this in last December in the middle of COVID and I did not want him going away without some sort of bite appliance to control bruxism at night. So what I did was make a chair side occlusal appliance. This is thicker, the thicker sheets of hard acetate thermoplastic that I drew over the study model. Again, adding quick cure methyl methacrylate acrylic had them bite down. There are the indentations of the opposing dentition, carve that away, add a, add a little bit more and try to make something that would be smooth and, and ex accepting to his tongue. And that was inserted so he could go home recognizing that if he does clench and grind at night, at least I've got my porcelain protected. So that's a chair side occlusal appliance. Determinants for smile design. Every case is different. What are the driving features? In my mind, it's always an interplay between aesthetics and function. And in my mind, function, and in these cases, over-engineering of strength is paramount. Aesthetics are secondary. And with experience, hopefully comes the ability to visualize an endpoint before you start. And part of doing that is working through this process of, in the provisional phase, what will be acceptable to my eye, what will be acceptable to the patient's eye, and what is acceptable to their physiology. So the design of restorations must be harmonious with the host environment. So pretty porcelain, that's the easiest part. It's making restorations function and durable over a lifetime for me is the key element in success. And these are my guiding principles. Going back in summation, success is a planned event. Multiple factors. And he gave me permission to use this photograph because he's seen some of my other presentations and says he wants 50% of the royalties I get. So I told him no problem. And the resistance to, to treatment just drove the case in terms of difficulty. But he was just the once he said okay, he was a wonderful gentleman. And getting around these two molars when I saw, sorry, these two anterior teeth was just a heartbreaker when I saw it because it, it took a simple case and made it far more difficult. And I told them, Joe, you know, the 
the picture we took at my office, you don't see your teeth. Could you please send me another picture? And this is the picture he sent. Just a wonderful, engaging gentleman with huge massive muscles. So at some point, I've got to get to the lower arch and hopefully he doesn't wait too long. And that's the case. Hope you enjoyed it.